Susan, it's so great to finally be able to get together again. Oh, it sure is. And I really appreciate you picking up the bill. I'm happy to. I've got the extra cash. Since we've all been driving so much more again, I've been using GetUpside, the free gas app that pays you cash back for every gallon of gas you buy. Wait a minute. Are you saying you actually get paid cash when you buy gas with the GetUpside app? Yes, up to 25 cents a gallon. Cash back every time I buy gas. Does that actually add up to anything? Some months I make 200 to 300 bucks. <laughs> Wow, that's serious extra cash. I'm downloading the free GetUpside app now. Download the free GetUpside app now in the App Store or Google Play to save up to 25 cents a gallon when you buy gas. Use promo code FILL for a 25 cents a gallon bonus on your first tank. That's up to 50 cents a gallon on your next fill-up. You can cash out anytime to PayPal or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Just download the free GetUpside app and use promo code FILL for a 25 cents a gallon bonus on your first tank. That's code FILL. The following is a Hoop Bowl presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Somehow, we're under four weeks from the start of the NBA season. I just don't know how we got there. Slap me in the face with this stuff. Hello, everybody. Hi. Welcome to the show. This is Fantasy NBA Today, a hoop ball presentation. I'm your host, Dan Bespris. We'll be talking to Adam King on today's podcast in a matter of moments. It's a punt spectacular on today's show, which is great because you know me. You guys that have been listening to this show for a long time, you know I'm a roto guy. Uh, I play head-to-head leagues. I don't punt that hard in them and I think I could probably stand to do a little bit more of that so we're going to go on a little bit of a journey together today talking to Adam about the the basics eh, it's not the basics so much it's actually it's it's deeper than that it's none of the basics are what we're looking for on this podcast we want to know how to get that biggest leg up so that'll be coming up here in a matter of moments can't wait to get into it with Adam you can follow me by the way on Twitter at Dan Bespris. Hoopball is hoop-ball.com. You can follow Hoopball on Twitter at HoopballFantasy. And once again, I'll remind all of you guys, Hoopball Leagues are open now. Reach out to me on Twitter or email TeamHoopBall at hoop-ball.com if you'd like to join a Hoopball Fantasy League with other listeners, pros, site readers, social media followers, whatever. It is some stiff competition. We got free leagues, we got paid leagues, we got Roto, we got head-to-head we got the usual fair, so bug me. We'd love to get you into those leagues. My good friend, Andre, will handle league placement. I can get you in touch with him if you reach out immediately. There's promo. There's some promo to go, but uh, we'll save most of that until a little bit deeper into the show. You guys have been so patient as we try to bring you all the things that are going on at Hoop Ball and across the fantasy landscape. Today, you don't need it. Okay, so... Uh, I've, I've lost track of the exact number of days it's been, but the, uh, the guest on today's show is someone that was on the program within the last two weeks, and there was a pretty good social media hoop ball forum kind of response that we felt necessitated kind of a follow-up. And, and I'll introduce... Our, uh, our buddy here in just a second, but I kind of wanted to give the, the backstory on it. We did a mailbag episode with the great Adam King, who we'll be talking to here in about 15 seconds. And one of the questions we got into was on punt strategy, which Adam is much more skilled at than I am. You guys know me. I'm the roto guy. I generally try to build a, a pretty damn balanced team. Sometimes I end up with a fairly weak points team because I think uh, those guys get overdrafted so often that it creates this ridiculous value bubble for eight other categories that by midseason, I'm in sort of like a soft punt points build. But it generally isn't on purpose. And then the only head-to-head league where I punt annually is this wacky 11 category one where you can uh, you can punt a few things and you can still win seven, eight, nine categories every week because there's 11. So people were like, all right, you guys need to talk more about punt stuff. And we got together and we figured out, yeah, we probably should do this. So welcome back to the show for our uh, very special punt deep dive episode 
to our good buddy, Adam King. Adam, what's up? What's going on, man? Good morning to you. We do this bit every time, so I got to keep it going. Good morning. We do. We do. Yeah. And I'm used to it now, so it's, it's fine. I actually, as I just touched on uh, before we came on there, I, my prep was uh, hampered last night and I blame you um, because I sat down to do some uh, prep and, and a little bit of research and I got uh, wrapped up watching your mock drafts with Josh. So. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, I've never done, I've never done a mock where I was in it and announcing it. The one that you and I hosted last year for HoopBall, I was on the sidelines narrating it. I think you were in that one. Weren't you picking in that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So you had to do like a little bit of both. I didn't. I was able to just say what everybody else was doing. It's really hard to do a mock draft while you're announcing a mock draft because you spend every second talking about what everybody else is doing, and then your own pick comes up, and you're like, oh, crap, I... I, I legitimately don't know who's on the board right now. There's now I've spent the last I've spent eight seconds realizing I don't know who's on the board, and so now I have thirty seven seconds to, to make a pick with zero <laughs> prep. But I actually thought it went relatively well for me. I came out of that with a pretty strong team, all things considered. Yeah, it sounded like that from from his uh, his projections at the end there, and and I did one of those earlier a couple of weeks ago with Josh, and it is really hard um, talking and drafting and. I've got another mock this morning, but thankfully uh, I'm not commentating it as well. I'm just in the mock. So <laughs> we have a bunch of things going. Easier. We've got my, my my pro mock, which you are not in because I wanted to go outside hoop ball. You got the hoop ball invitational, which I kind of mm. want you to tell people about at some point. We can save that for middle of the show. But there's like slow drafts and mocks happening all the time. They're very complicated to keep all of it straight. I don't have any idea who's on my teams, but in any event. Uh, it's punt day. It's punt day. Last time, Adam, you and I... Oh, by the way, you can follow Adam on Twitter. At AdamKing91. Very easy to find. Adam is very easy to spell. King is very easy to spell. And the numbers 9 and 1 should also be extremely easy to locate on your uh, QWERTY keyboard. They're up along the top where all the numbers are. You can find them. 9 and 1. Adam King 91 on Twitter. Go follow him now. We got some questions on the punt front. And I, I read through them. And I thought we could kind of start with those... And just see where they take us. Because a couple weeks ago, we got into it. We had other mailbag questions. So I, I kind of cut us off. I wanted to keep going on the punt front, but I cut us off because I figured we got to hit these other questions. But people were really into the discussion of strategy. And again, this is not something I do frequently. So just for those maybe that missed the mailbag episode, Adam, can you give us more of a strategic base on the, the punting discussion, when do you do it? What formats do you do it in? I think generally we agreed head-to-head is certainly the better uh, type for that. But what is your, what's your, kind of your mode there? How do you get into that mindset? Yeah, so it's, it, it is generally head-to-head uh, that, that you would do this. Uh, as we saw last night, in, uh, yesterday, last night, for those that saw your mock draft, that was a roto. Um, and so you're looking for a more balanced strategy w- when you sort of approach a roto league and, and points, obviously just you're drafting whoever has the most points. So for head to head, um, w- when you approach it, I mean, that that's really, it's an individual choice. Um, I, I tend to make my decision pretty early. Um, but you really, if, if you go in with a punt strategy, I guess the, the risk is, if you don't get the players that you want early, uh, you can go into panic mode pretty quickly because you, you don't actually know what you're doing. So, um, What do you do in a situation get, like that? I'm sorry to jump in, I like because that, that's something that I'm guessing a lot of people are going to end up wondering about. Even though we didn't get that question in, the, in the, the board, you know me, I like to get into the theory of this stuff. Mm. What if you don't get the guys that you're targeting early? Do you, do you abandon ship? Is there a way to come back from that? Um, no, look, I mean, I, I tend to have a, a couple of names ready to go, but, and, and it actually can go the other way. So I was in a, uh, as you said, I'm in so many mock drafts at the moment. I can't remember which one. <laughs> yeah. it, I think it was the one I did with the, on the ball boys podcast. Um, and I was at pick seven. So I was targeting, uh, Tatum or Lillard, they were going to be my, my two targets there at seven. I, I was pretty certain I, I would get at least one of those two. 
uh, and I had my strategy ready to go and Harden fell to me at seven. Um, and so I couldn't pass up on, on James Harden at pick seven. So I, I had to take him and that then sort of impacted my, my strategy a little bit because he's, he gets more assists, he gets more rebounds. Uh, he, his percentages aren't sort of quite as good from the field. Maybe he, he and, and I think, uh, a trap that I fell into um, when I, I went with James Harden. So I went in with the mindset that I was going to punt uh, rebounds, blocks, field goal percentage. And with Lillard and, and Tatum, that's okay. With Harden, he, he actually is a positive in rebounds um, quite significantly. As we know, he, he's sort of a triple-double threat kind of guy. So it threw, it threw me off in that category. And... I also, because it was a rush decision to take him, I then drafted based on having taken Lillard or um, or Tatum first, and I underestimated or or overestimated. I'm not sure what the right phrase is. <laughs> um, Harden's points output this year because I don't think he'll be scoring close to 30 points. I think he'll be down around. 24, 25, um, whereas Lillard and Tatum could both be up closer to 30. So I that's where I sort of struggled a little bit then because I, I think I took Fred Van Fleet, my second pick, and and he's not going to score Nick close to 30 points. So I actually struggled in points in that, in that build and it, it threw me off. So just something as small as that uh, impacted... If you could my, do it again, mind. if you could do it again and you still ended up with Harden in the first, how would you adjust your strategy going forward? Would you abandon ship on the rebound punt or would you kind of continue down that path and just make some slight tweaks to say uh, maybe get a little bit more scoring or I mean, what's what's the next step there? Because I like me, I'm sitting over here on the roto side going, sweet, James Harden fell to you. But you're like, mm. no, I wasn't ready for this guy. Yeah, so I probably would have, I probably still would have kept the same, uh, the same strategy. But I just, I probably wouldn't have punted as hard with rebounds. Um, so maybe targeted a centre a little bit earlier. Uh, and I think with my second pick, I would have just tried to get some some points there. So Van Fleet, uh, I generally sort of take him second in in that sort of punt build to get the assists uh, and the and the steals and the threes, um, but not worry too, mi- too much about his scoring because I, I have, would have a, a guy that's sort of scoring 27, 28 with my first pick. Um, so maybe I, I would sort of switch my focus a little bit to points. So so try and get someone who's who's going to score um, more than 20, 21 per game. But but I'd try to stay on the, on the same track if I could because I think – Switching switching strategy completely um, is hard to do, uh, especially in a in a fast draft. If it's a slow draft, then absolutely you can change. But but in a draft like this, where it's forty five seconds or sixty seconds, uh, you can end up going off the rails pretty quickly. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Because and and it's not like you ended up with Cat in the first round instead of uh, Lillard. You ended up with a Harden, who's you know slightly better in defensive stats rebounds assists uh and then a little weaker in total points so it's not a it's not a complete mega ridiculous shift in the kind of player you got it's just a few things that you sort of weren't uh expecting to come your way Mm. i want to use that question to sort of jump into the first one that came in this was sorry to all the other questions we're going to get to here uh whatever we get to this was my favorite of the questions because i think this one spins into the entire punt strategy as a whole. The question was, Adam, is it okay to reach if you're punting to ensure you grab players to fit your build, especially those mid-round picks where things can get hairy? I'm actually, I don't even care about the mid-round part to begin this question. I'd rather just take the first half and say, you know, I, th- I think we, we all know that the answer to this question is sort of a, a soft yes, but how, why? Like, what are some of the parameters you work from to figure out when you go and get your punt guys. That's actually something that I still struggle with because it's not something I do very often. When do you go 
grab someone who has, you know, an ADP of like 70, uh, but he's absolutely required on your fantasy team or the punt won't work. Like, would you take him at 35 or is that completely insane? It seems like you just, you can't afford to risk some of the key punt guys falling into someone else's hands. Yeah, it's uh, it's a hard one. Um, and I think obviously the later you get in a draft, the more you can reach. Uh, and, and that was something that, that you and Josh talked about um, in, in your draft is that once you get to sort of pick 90, pick 100, you're just taking who you need. And so you're not you're not looking at projections or rankings and saying, oh, this guy's 130. I can't take him at 100 because we know that the difference in value once you get to that end of the draft is so small that you're simply drafting for, for need then. Um, early in the drafts, it's you, you don't want to reach probably more than more than a couple of spots um, early on. And then I, I would sort of say, as you get each round further, you can extend that out. So, for example, in the first round, um, if you've got pick... Six, for instance, um, I'd be okay taking Jason Tatum with pick six, even though he's probably going to go at around eight, nine, ten uh, in most drafts. So you, you're reaching by maybe two or three spots there. So not a ton uh, and, there, but as you get farther, I assume that number gets bigger. Yeah. So the second round, um, if, if so, what if you've got pick six, then you're going to have about pick seventeen or eighteen or something coming back. Uh, I'm okay with taking a guy who who might normally be going on the turn there, so sort of stretch it out to half a round, um, and then into the third round, again, sort of maybe half a round to probably not quite a full round once once you're in the third round. But uh, an example, so at the moment, as you touched on, we've got our hoop ball invitational going on, um, and I can bring up my team because I'm punting. And well, that's this isn't good. coming that's out till tomorrow, so the other guys won't hear my stress. My, that's what right. my next picks. Be. You, need, you need this thing to move along a couple of rounds just to make sure. I, you let me know when the picks are done, and I'll release the podcast. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Look, I'll, I won't go too deep, but I know my my team so far. Uh, okay, so I took um, at pick twelve. I took Bradley Beal. Um, that's not a reach, I don't think. Uh, I, I think Beal is is fine. Um, as a late first rounder this year. Coming back, I took Fred Van Fleet at 17. Um, based on on ADP and that sort of thing, that probably is a bit high, but I I have no issue. I don't think that's too much of a reach. Taking yeah, and, and honestly, 17. I think he's he's headed there anyway. By the way, he's that's where he's like his his Yahoo. Uh, actually, I mentioned this on on yesterday's podcast, which, which you haven't heard yet because it actually dropped right as we're recording this episode. Um, Yahoo's got him projected at 19. So even though his ADP is like 22 or 23, or maybe even a little bit later, he's actually kind of on the rise. So he's he's probably going inside the top 20. So you took him where? You just said 17. So that's only like a couple slots, I think, of, ahead of where he's going to end up. Yeah, so 17 is fine uh, for him. Um my next pick was a, an auto pick because, uh, as happens with a lot of these drafts, I'm potentially the only Australian, so I have to set my cue because <laughs> I set the draft to sleep when you guys are asleep, not when I'm <laughs> asleep. So um, I got so the the cue cleared out. So I, I had uh, on my cue I had um, Brandon Ingram. So this is at pick forty because it's a it's a fourteen team league. So pick forty I had. Uh, Brandon Ingram lined up. I don't think that's too much of a reach for him, uh, but I did have Lonzo Ball queued up as well, and going at pick 40 is probably a bit higher than than he will go in a lot of drafts. But I'm okay. I was okay with, with going for him there because um, he was going to add assists and steals, and assists, as we know, are really hard to get later in drafts. So um, I was I was happy to reach for him there, but he went two picks, no one pick before me. So I actually ended up with OG Ananobi there, uh, and I have no idea what his ADP is, and I'm I'm okay to take him at pick forty. I, I do, do you think that's a reach at pick forty for for Ananobi? 
Um, a little bit. I, I, he's actually one of those guys to me that's kind of taking off, and mm. uh, I, this surprised the hell out of me too. I, I thought. I didn't think people were going to be as excited about him as it seems like they've turned out to be. His early ADP on Yahoo came out at like 63, but his pre his projections on Yahoo have him at 44. So that's probably mm-hmm. where you got him. That's probably where he ends up going by the time most people are drafting in, you know, two weeks from today or whatever it is, or even later, two and a half, three weeks from today. So... I guess my answer to your question is almost twofold. Do I think it's too early? Yeah, I think he's going to get hyped out of a lot of his value. Um, I think he has an opportunity, if he stays relatively healthy this year, to beat that number. But I also worry that we're kind of pricing ourselves out. Like, when he was going in the 60s, I thought that was fantastic. Him going in the 40s now, I'm like, um, all right, well, if he gets hurt at all, this one could fall on its face a little bit. Uh I do. I love his fantasy game. I'm just so irritated by that one because I thought for sure he'd be going later because he doesn't have a loud fantasy game. It's just for whatever reason he was the guy that kind of everyone coalesced around this off season. Yeah, and and yeah, I I agree. I would I would love to be getting him later than that. Um, and you probably could again. And this comes back to sort of knowing knowing your league and knowing who you're drafting against. If if you're drafting against guys that you know simply turn up on draft day and just draft and do no prep and no research, then you probably could get him much later than that. But um, the hype is, is building already for him. So I think he's he, you're sort of going to have to target him inside the top 50 at a minimum. Um, but I was okay taking him there for this build because he uh, he's a forward. So I, I, I'm going for a guard heavy sort of lineup, but um so he fills out one of my forward spots um, and and then gets me plenty of steals. Um, nice number of threes. I think his scoring will be decent enough this season. So I was happy with him there. And then I had my fourth pick early this morning. Uh, and I, I hate this pick, but I'm okay with it. I went with CJ McCollum at 45. And that's that's a reach, I think, for him. Uh, I think you could probably get him around later. But again, points are tricky to get, um, so so I needed points, and I was sort of tossing up between him and and then I had a couple of more traditional point guards, D'Angelo Russell, Derek White, guys like that, sort of in my queue. But I thought McCollum would probably go before it got back to me, and he's one of the better scorers left um, on the board. So I took him, and then I'm hoping that everyone else doesn't believe the hype, and Darius Garland is sitting there for my next pick. Well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, well, okay. I, I think I think it'll be back to you before this show drops tomorrow. Okay, we'll so, um, like, in terms of the, the reaching element, it the only one of these four that I feel like you really kind of went out on a limb for is probably McCollum, and he's, like, the least punty type of player at the shooting guard spot I think you can find because he's at, like you can set your watch to what he does and he's not mm. like he's not terrific at any one individual he was very good at three pointers last year he sort of ratcheted that up a notch but it was like I think last season was 23 points about four boards five assists a steal percentages were fine not not terrific in either one but also not blast you in the foot I you know Freddie Van Fleet of your pick so far, he feels more like the the guy you could turn into a punt build dude because of how bad he is at field goal percent. But your other guys, it, it really just looks like you're going extraordinarily guard heavy so far. So at what point, because even Darius Garland as your next pick, which I, I've lost track of what number that would be. It's the late fifth round in a 14 team or so. It's a little bit shy of pick 70. What is that? 68, I guess. Yeah, it's something like that. Um, That's... Like that's a couple picks later than where I've seen him go in other mock drafts. So, it's, but it's relatively close to where he's gone. You haven't really done a ton of reaching so far. When do you? Okay, uh, this is a two-parter. It's a two-part question. Apologies. See if see if we can keep both in our heads at the same time. The question, the two-part question is: At what point do you start like getting? crazy with the guys you're targeting and then in this particular build that you're looking for who are those guys who who is the guy well, i don't want you to give your strategy away but like 
None of the guys you've taken so far have been guys that I would call a strict punt build kind of dude. Like, well, Freddie Van Fleet is close, but, you know, if you took Giannis in the first or Zion in the second or something like that, you're sort of pigeonholing yourself. Uh, I don't think that you've closed the door on anything yet other than just saying, screw big men. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's with a, a lot of my leagues, especially the competitive ones, it is a... It it is more of punting a position, I guess, or, or punting, um, which which straight away means that you're going to be punting multiple categories. Um, so I will just go guard heavy, uh, and that's why I like players who get you out of position stats. So centers that get assists or hit threes, uh, or forwards that that sort of do the same thing, get steals which is why I liked Ananobi there. It's why I like Tatum uh, as my first round because although he's a forward, he he does he, he's very strong in your guard stats. So with most leagues, you're going to have position requirements where you've got to have two forwards or three forwards, two centers, whatever it might be. So at some point, you will have to draft players that, that are – are playing in those positions that don't favor your punt build. And so obviously with this one, it's a center um, that I'm going to struggle with. Um, sure. Because... But when do, you, when do you start to look at that? How far do you go with this guard uh, pandemonium before you're like, all right, all right, all right, I got to do a center. Is it like the last thing you do, like your 10th pick out of 10 starters? Or is there a spot where you're like, okay, I've done this guard build. There are like four big men out there that are built for this type of thing. A big man who maybe is not great at shooting the basketball or, you know, hits a bunch of threes, very good free throw shooter. Someone like a Lowry Markinen pops into my head. I know he can rebound a little bit, but he's mostly scoring threes, free throw percent kind of stuff. When do you make your move on that? It seems like you, and maybe I'm doing this wrong. Again, I'm kind of learning along with the people that are listening I would think, again, feel free to tell me I'm way off here, but I would think that you'd want to go sort of guarantee you got the right fit big man, but, or is the big man so inconsequential in a build like this that you really shouldn't go get them until the last possible second? What's the right way there? I'm not sure there is a right way. I know for me, because I... I, I I've done this punt quite a few times. I have a list of centers that I'm, that I'm targeting and I know where I want to target them. Hmm. Um, it's from, I mean, I guess in my mind and, and having done this previously, it's if, if my punt is successful and I do it well, sort of throwing any center in there at the end is fine. Um, so, I would be so in a, in a punt build like this. The the guys that I'm sort of eyeing off, Lowry Markinen is one uh, because he he has centre eligibility. Kelly Olynyk is one that I target, but he is going higher than I want him to be going this year. <laughs> um, and I know you you got him at 99 in the draft. I did, uh, with, and I think he beats that mark in in a non punt format also. So I felt pretty yeah. good about that one. So he he is a a really good fit for this build because his percentages uh, free throw percentages are, are decent. He hits threes. He gets you a steal a game. Um, he can pass. So so he's not. So you wouldn't, I guess, class him as one of those elite um, facilitating centers. But but he can pass. Um, so he's a guy that I'm targeting. PJ Washington is another one. So. I'll sort of have an idea in my head of what round I want to target these guys. If they go, then I don't sort of then say, well, I need to just grab any center here um, because I have some names that generally aren't being drafted in standard leagues who I'm happy to take with my last pick and throw in at the center spot. Hmm. Um, what's the what's the but, earliest you would take one of those centers? It seems like not the first five rounds. Seems like you really want to lock in your guard stuff at least through five. Or am I wrong there? Also, yeah, it's generally generally after yeah, sort of the middle rounds would be as early as I'd want to go. So with my McCollum pick there, I was I I flirted with the idea of picking up Nurkic, 
um, because he gets assists. Uh, he he gets 1.1, 1.2 steals a game. Um, his free throws aren't terrible, but I couldn't do it. Um, I sort of wanted to build on my strengths a little bit more. Uh, so I would say generally it's sort of going to be around round six, round seven that I'll grab a center, but there was a, a draft that I did where, uh, I took, uh, Vucevic at, because he fell to me at pick 22 or something. Uh, and, and I was sort of like, well, I can fill my center spot really early here. Um, I was picking at the end of the second round, so it was coming back to me fairly soon. So I sort of thought, well, I'll take him, I'll throw him in there, my center spot's done, and then I can start back on my my sort of guard <laughs> focus from you, there. You didn't feel tempted in that draft to go, maybe I don't need to punt at this point? Um, no, I think it was a mock, and, and so I just did it anyway. <laughs> um, and because sure. uh, I don't know who I took... I, yeah, I can't remember, again, what draft that was. There's too many. But um, that, that is a spot where you could say, well, if I'm going to get him, you know, maybe I don't punt here. Um, I just find it quite hard to, if, if you're in a really competitive league, to win a head-to-head, um, to win that league is hard without punting. I, I just think because everyone knows what they're doing. There's so much information out there nowadays that, that people are often working to their own strategies and, and have research to back them up. And so uh, I just find that an easier way. And, and I think obviously in a roto league, uh, you generally don't punt, but I do have a, a, a mate of mine who is in a, uh, a roto league and it's, it's a weird league. I don't know the settings. He, they had 13 categories. Um, last yeah. I mean, you year, can get, you can I, get away with punting one out of 13. That's a, for yeah, sure. well, we've we've actually managed to to talk him around a little bit and and get him to punt um two two I think two categories this year um in a roto because I had a look at the standings from last year for him and the guy that won it while he may not have openly been punting he, based on the standings he pretty much punted three categories and mm. won um and the categories are weird too they they're not like personal fouls is one so <laughs> what uh, and no. their rosters are, I, I can't wrap my head around his league because I'm not in it, I suppose. But you only have five active players um, oh. each day and unlimited streaming. So people, like, they draft and then they just, they stream yeah, all that the season. Yeah, that's, that's, that's bonkers. It, that's a bat bleep crazy set of formats. Yeah. I, you know, I would yeah. argue that even as a roto guy, you can get away with punting one category. Uh, like I've said, I've sort of leaned into it uh, more than one time. It generally ends up being points for me because I tend to, to shy away from those. Uh, but it's not always points. I think I had a uh, I had a team recently where I ended up kind of punting threes. I don't really know how it ended up on that because that's not that's not a direction my team usually goes. Um, I just I knew my team had no shot. I think it was a keeper league, and and my keepers were bad, and they were not good at shooting three pointers. And I sort of had like one inside straight kind of chance to be competitive in that league. And that was to win percentages and defensive stats. And somehow I ended up with just like a bunch of guys who had really good percentages, got some steals, got some blocks, uh, but for somehow like didn't rebound or assist or shoot three pointers. And I, I had to swing a trade for Draymond green in the middle of the, anyway, long story short, uh, I, I placed, I didn't win it. Uh, but I've definitely won multiple leagues punting points in Roto, kind of mid-season mode in head-to-head what you mentioned a few minutes ago and that actually sort of like a light bulb went off for me which is weird because this seems relatively straightforward and yet maybe a lot of folks don't think about it that way I didn't really is the idea of position punting that if you're punting one thing in head-to-head you're sort of it kind of behooves you at that point to just say you know what the hell with like these two things they're correlated why would i worry about blocks if i'm punting rebounds or something like that i can spend these draft capital on just more of the things that i'm strong at as opposed to like well i need to figure out a way to squeeze a couple blocks out of this team that's mostly guards that doesn't make any sense um 
one thing that I asked you on the last show we did was, did you have trouble getting a first round buy in your leagues where you were punting three or four categories? And you said sometimes, but if you win every week, you tend to climb up to the top, but that you sort of generally go into your playoffs in third place. But I think you also said you kind of didn't care because your team was so damn good in five categories. You were like, look, I'll beat everybody every week, five to four. And that part doesn't really matter, which again, that's not something that I can usually preach because I'm not a a strict punter. I want to get us into another question here, though, because I, I, we could talk about the sort of the when of the, the draft side. And we only have like 15 minutes left. And I want to make sure we get to something other than this. This one is, I think almost like adjunct it's a it's a corollary to the first question but i thought it was it was well said i'm going to replace part of this question because the question itself was if i grab Giannis, do i have to punt or can i still win my leagues if i nail my all my other picks let me change this and say adam if you take someone in the first round who's bad at a category who's a significant net negative in something can you still win without punting that category? The reason Giannis comes up is because he's the only real guy with a first round ADP that's like three standard deviations worse than the average NBA player in any one statistical category. Um, everybody else is serviceable. Like Steph Curry is very bad at blocking shots, but you can make up for it with one very good shot blocker. It's not quite the same negative impact as a Giannis. So, what if you have Giannis early? You got, you know my take on this, which is don't draft Giannis in the first round. But if you do, do you pretty much have to punt at that point? Uh, I, I think you probably do with with at least with someone who who is has that much of an impact. As you said, I mean you you're going to get players. You're rarely going to find players who will help you in every category. I. I can't think of any off the top of my head that would help you in every category. Maybe in an eight cat you might, but in a nine cat, it's highly unlikely. Um, someone like Jokic is going to be close, um, but for for someone like Giannis who who just tanks you so hard, I think that I think you almost have to, and because I I think if you don't, you might actually later in drafts you'll find yourself chasing players or reaching for players who help you in free throws, but might sort of hurt you in other categories. And it, it, it'll almost have that a reverse punt effect. I don't know if that's the right term there, but it'll mean that you're overvaluing players because of one category, because, oh, I can get this guy. He really helps me with free throws, but they might then really hurt you in rebounds mm. and, and blocks and points, which which almost then sort of negates Giannis's positive impact. Um, and so it can have that, that reverse effect. So I think with someone like Giannis, you really just have to embrace the punt and, and, and mm. then target someone like a Zion in the second round. Um, but it, 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 it's sort of, as you said, he, he sort of, He's the he's one of the extremes, and you would have sort of Ben Simmons in there, and almost Fred Van Fleet to some point with his with his field goal percentage. Um, he's not quite as bad as Giannis in free throws, but I I would say it, it's going to be tricky to come back from that. Um, yeah, it's just it's it's a little bit risky for me. That is what I would have guessed actually on that one, and um, and you'll see that sometimes. Although I feel like a lot of people that draft Giannis in the first round are not doing so with the intention of punting am i am i insane in that regard like i feel like people really do believe he's a first rounder even if you're not punting free throws but he was i think he was the single largest negative impact player in any one category in the league last year like i don't think anybody was as bad in free throws for your team in anything as Giannis was in that Maybe Russell Westbrook in turnovers, I think, is the only other one that's close based on standard deviations and things of that nature. Like that, it really is. It's a it's a runaway. So that one, the question almost becomes too easy. What if you ended up with like Clint Capella in the you know third round or something like that? Now, you know, I don't think that one necessarily forces you. It feels like this is something only uh, Adam that comes up if you spend a first round pick on 
someone who's that terrible. I don't know that anybody else in the league forces you into a spot the way that Giannis does, except, again, maybe for Zion. But, like, if you're drafting him, you are hopefully already have built a very good foul shooting team, and Zion is just going to bring you back towards the midpoint, or you're already punting at that point. Because, again, you've made your decision before you get to some of these other guys. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so. And with Capella, I mean, if if you're... I mean, when you look at, at um, guys that really hurt you in percentages, so, so taking Giannis and Capella as examples, they're both obviously huge negatives in free throws. But you you need to remember to look at the volume as well. So Giannis sort of gets to the line, uh, looking at last year's numbers, almost three times more than Capella. So someone who's shooting sort of mid sixties, high sixties on ten attempts per game, is is going to bring you down a lot more than a guy shooting sixty percent. But if he's only getting to the line three times a game, then you can you can sort of live with that if you can get on your team a high volume free throw shooter so if you were to have someone like a Harden as your first pick mm. Capella as your second pick I think the the fact that Harden gets there so much almost sort of makes Capella's issues uh, not a non-factor but it, it minimizes the impact quite a lot all right I'm going to move to the next question on our list here and see what we can get through again um Someone asked about who the punt blocks center guys are. I'll just tell everybody, if you want to know who the lists are that Adam's referencing, he wrote a piece for the hoop ball draft guide on this. So please go get yourself a damn hoop ball draft guide and you can see the actual names. But you know that on this podcast, I don't like to just give the answers away. If you want the answers, you go get a damn draft guide. If you want to understand how you get to the answers, that damn it is why we do this podcast here. Um, here's one. I've actually, I've tried this, uh, punt field goal percent before. So this question says, hi, Adam, I'm considering a punt field goal percent this year with Dame, but I've never done it. Tried a couple of times and Mox felt like I flopped. Do you think Dame first, Freddie Van Vliet second is overkill? My question actually, see that he's saying, can you suggest what categories to target in approximately which round? I think that's, there's a little bit of a feel element to that. I'm changing the question up, Adam, for you, which is, is there such thing as overkill? in a in a punt build or do you just keep leaning into it as hard as you can at what point have you gone too far provided you're getting five very strong categories is there such a point probably depends on your your mindset really i mean as we know punting is is meant to be not actively trying to be bad in a category it's just ignoring a category so I mean, you, there is obviously going to be that line that, that you step over when you have gone so far that, that you are really bad in it. And and um, for me, I, I'm okay with that, but it does mean that you have to be prepared for the fact that you're probably n- absolutely no chance of winning that category <laughs> in any week. I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to punt hard and, and you see it as overkill, then you're done in that category. So it means you do need to build your team really well um, because there isn't going to be that week where a few of your players sort of shoot 49% instead of 42 because you've got so many of those guys on your team that the chances of them all doing that in a week is is next to nothing. So, there, I mean, there is a point where, where it does become... Um, an aggressive punt, I suppose, where, where you're, you're almost seeking out those players that are the worst in certain categories. Um, but it, it is, it does really lock you into your punt and, and limits the, the opportunity for you to sneak some categories here and there during the season. And the last one, uh, this one's dynasty. So I, I legit have no take on this at all. <laughs> hey, Adam, is it, advisable to go into a dynasty or keeper league draft with a punting mindset or is it best to maintain a balanced team to allow for strategic flexibility over multiple seasons i'm doing my first dynasty league this year i would assume that those types of leagues it's actually great to try to build a well-rounded team so that you know if you want to kind of re re 
tinker on the fly, trade away a bunch of guys. You're not stuck in one particular build. But again, I might be way off. Is this still kind of a roto versus head-to-head discussion? How would you handle a long-term investment? Would you still consider punting there? Yeah, an interesting one because I'm not in any dynasty leagues either. So I think our combined knowledge of, of dynasty is is average at best. So <laughs> I would say um, I think probably I'm probably with you. I think where you you probably don't want to. D- go hard in a punt um, just because it, it limits your flexibility down the track. Um, but it probably also depends a little bit on, on your league settings. So dynasty keeper, they, they can be very different. Um, a dynasty is obviously where you keep your sa- the same roster year over year. Whereas a keeper league, you might only be keeping two players or three players from one year to the next. So in a dynasty, I, I think, if if you go if you're sort of in a a draft for your first dynasty league and you go a hard punt, it almost means you're locked into that punt then for the next I don't know next few years. Um, but whereas if it's a keeper league, you can I mean it might be fine you you keep your players and and maybe your league resets. I'm in a keeper league where we reset every four years I think. Mm. Um, and so you you go like I've done a punt and but I've sort of fallen into a punt just because of my keepers and 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 the way my team has built um, naturally and through trades and that sort of thing. But this year, uh, my my main keeper was Kawhi Leonard, so I'm stuffed because he's not going to play. Yeah. Um, and so I've had to keep other players that I wouldn't have kept otherwise. Because I think my only chance of winning is by re- going really hard and punting. So I'm I'm actually keeping. Um, so Robert Williams is one of my keepers probably this year, um, whereas he wouldn't normally be a keeper in our league. Uh, so it's yeah, it's an interesting one. It might be something that we we could put into our well Discord or on Twitter and, and put it up to Rhett because he's sort of our our dynasty expert. So it might be one that he has some opinion on as well. And that is where we will put a pin in things. I honest to goodness, I think there's probably more here, Um, but we're going to, we're going to let it mellow for now because this was a solid 45 minutes on punt strategy. And I have still a hundred more questions to ask. I think the one that, that I really want to keep going here, we'll take the rest of this to Twitter uh, and hopefully people will engage. I think there's a lot of folks that want to know more about punting Come, for me, it comes down to the the draft kind of game theory element of it, which is, again, when do you do the parts of a punt that need to accomplish, which is like, when do I get the most important players? When do I make sure I get the handful of uh, center eligible or whatever you're punting? If you're punting guard stuff, when do I get the handful of point guard eligible guys that still get the stats I need for you in your your big man punt when do I go get the centers and, and power forwards I need? I'm sure you have, you have your list of guys, but there's probably like a, here's the range of places I might consider taking them. There's a lot of strategic stuff that I think we could still dive into. So we'll take that over to the social media sphere. Uh, Adam King, at Adam King 91 on Twitter. My man, um, you know, we may need to do some punt check-ins to actually throughout the season in addition to our other stuff, but I'm sure we'll talk to you soon here on Fantasy NBA Today. Will we not? I would say so. Yes, yeah. I, I just got a a message from uh, Alan. Actually, Alan Strokey, and he informs me that you'll be doing a roto strategy show with him this weekend, and he's asked me to do a head to head one. So there we go. There we go. We'll That'll be on our video on feed. Now. That'll be over on the Hoop Ball YouTube feed. So might as well get a plug in for that. That's uh, YouTube dot com slash Hoop Ball. If you guys want to follow our YouTube stuff, Alan Strokey doing a wonderful job revamping the hoop ball youtube page there's actual like legit recent cool content happening over there he did a video mock with zach hanshu pretty recently and um yeah so we'll looks like you and i are going back to back baby the roto side and the head-to-head side but everybody just got the head-to-head right here on this one adam thanks my man we'll talk to you soon no worries have a good uh, what evening afternoon evening. <laughs> whenever whenever anybody's <laughs> whenever listening that's who knows when anybody's listening to the pod thanks again no worries thanks man no worries. 
Action Adam King, ladies and gentlemen, at Adam King 91 on Twitter. Make sure once again to give him a follow before you finish up whatever it is you're doing the rest of this lovely September the 22nd, 27 days until the start of the NBA season. I want to remind everybody uh, to please, and there is a piece of NBA news I want to just throw out there. We'll probably analyze it more as the, the fallout from it begins to take shape. Uh, but before we talk about the NBA news break of today, please, if you have a moment, subscribe to the podcast. I've said it before. I'll say it once on every single show leading up to opening night. This is the most important time of the year for us. If you are just coming back to the show after a long stretch, if you're new listening to the podcast, a five-star review and a rating goes a long, long way towards moving us up the board, and then more folks can find the show, and it's this positive feedback loop. And then uh, you won't have to hear as many advertisements because if we get gigantic, then you really only need like one, and you can uh, pay for a podcast forever. But while we are medium size. Got to put a couple coins in the piggy bank. You guys can help us get through this to the next step by, again, subscribing. That's probably the biggest thing of all. And then those five-star reviews, those are also quite helpful. News of the day is a weird shakeup out of Minnesota. Uh, Gerson Rosas was summarily, like, basically guillotine here this morning. Apparently, nobody saw this coming of course, Rosas working closely under Daryl Morey in Houston. There's a lot floating around on the internet right now that it has to do with a Ben Simmons thing that maybe could be coming down the pipeline. We don't know. So as of right now, leave it alone. I will say that, you know, I've been writing up my season win totals projections, and I leaned pretty good to the over with Minnesota based on how strongly they closed last season. I think there was sort of an era of good feelings developing there. I don't know if this changes that, but I don't think you can make a bet on the Wolves right at this moment because it sure does seem like something is happening behind the scenes and it's big and it's acute that it's not like a little thing that they can just figure out between the two sides. This felt like a him or me sort of moment because... Lord knows what could have possibly been happening here that would cause this type of thing. Anyway, Sachin Gupta is going to be taking over as the president of basketball operations, at least in an interim basis. The guy who created the trade machine. That's kind of cool. Anyway, we'll keep a close eye on all of that stuff in Minnesota. At the at this exact moment, it doesn't change anything from our perspective, at least on the fantasy side. But... If something's about to come rolling through on the Ben Simmons front, then there's going to be a pretty good board shakeup that we'll have to take care of at that point. Reminder once again, everybody, that the Hoop Ball Draft Guide is for sale at hoop-ball.com. The better deal is the Fantasy Pass for $5.99 a month. That gets you the Draft Guide. The Brewski one, $50. Oh, yes, that's the thing that everybody wants. And... All season long, Fantasy Pass is a six-month membership. You get Discord access, chat with the pros, like myself, actually. I'm in that Discord, along with a number of our other brilliant fantasy minds, like the aforementioned Adam King, Eric Ong, Steve Vidovich. I mean, truly, the list goes on and on. I couldn't name them all, even if I tried on today's show. Do check that out. Fantasy Pass, hoop-ball.com. Just follow at HoopBallFantasy on Twitter. You'll see the ads that flash by. Click on one of them. Go check it out. Also, shout out to our buddy Alan Soroki, who's been on this show a couple of times. Uh, the HoopBall YouTube channel getting revamped once again with cool stuff. They're doing some top 100 projection shows. That's really awesome. Really fun time of year. Cool stuff going down. We, tomorrow, what the hell is tomorrow? Thursday? Tomorrow, Thursday, we will start diving into the mock draft results, our pro mock that's been going on. It's just about wrapped up. I think we're about one, two rounds from done. We'll go through that one with a fine-tooth comb, and when we're done going through it, we'll talk to all of the pros in it and get their feelings on how things are going. Of course, we're going to be checking in on Yahoo ADP information every couple of days, see who's moving up and down the board, see what sort of projections are shifting around. This is where you got to be on your toes. You don't want to miss a thing. I'm Dan Baspers. Thanks again to Adam King. Uh, Friday, by the way, we'll talk, I think, to Aaron Ruski again. You got to double check on that one. We got a lot more to cover with the big dog. What a great time. 27-day countdown. It's on. Have a great day, everybody. We'll talk to you tomorrow.
This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation. Susan, it's so great to finally be able to get together again. Oh, it sure is. And I really appreciate you picking up the bill. I'm happy to. I've got the extra cash. Since we've all been driving so much more again, I've been using GetUpside, the free gas app that pays you cash back for every gallon of gas you buy. Wait a minute. Are you saying you actually get paid cash when you buy gas with the GetUpside app? Yes, up to 25 cents a gallon. Cash back every time I buy gas. Does that actually add up to anything? Some months I make 200 to 300 bucks. Wow, that's serious extra cash. I'm downloading the free GetUpside app now. Download the free GetUpside app now in the App Store or Google Play to save up to 25 cents a gallon when you buy gas. Use promo code FILL for a 25 cents a gallon bonus on your first tank. That's up to 50 cents a gallon on your next fill-up. You can cash out anytime to PayPal or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Just download the free GetUpside app and use promo code FILL for a 25 cents a gallon bonus on your first tank. That's code FILL.